Oh man, that was fantastic. A great ride. Brings back a lot of memories from a long time ago. Wow, fun ride. I was a very happy camper when I found out I could serve my God by flying airplanes. And I'd been a commercial pilot for a number of years, airline. And when I heard about the work of Wycliffe Bible Translators and JARS, that was a joy in my life to serve God by taking airplanes to the places where they were useful in the work of Bible translation. Yeah, well, at 100 years of age, you're like a man about 60. So you, you, have, you, you have slowed down the aging process, as you yeah. know. There's very few people past 100 years of age who can begin to keep up with you, even be alive, as you know. Yeah, my objective is to slow down as slowly as possible. Slow down as slowly as possible. My Lord Jesus came that we might have eternal life but he also promised us an abundant life. And I have taken him seriously on that point because I've lived life to the full. In 1927, Lindbergh flew the first solo flight nonstop from New York, landed in Paris. He made a tour of the central United States and deliberately he circled every schoolhouse he could find and he circled our schoolhouse. My first airplane ride, that was a fun experience. I think I was about 10 or 11 years old in Sulphur, Oklahoma. I was in the yard one day and a plane flew over very low and it looked like he was going to be landing. So I jumped on my bike and rode out, and sure enough, he landed. So I went over and talked to him, and he said, yeah, I'm giving rides, $4. So I, I had to go back home and break my piggy bank and get the $4 out to come back and get my first airplane ride. I didn't tell my parents about it until much later. It was a wonderful experience, and it cemented my idea of becoming a pilot. My father deserted my mother and my sister and me when I was six years old. And my mother took us back to her parents. So we grew up in the home of my grandparents. And uh, he was a farm man. They were not very loving in a obvious way. I knew my grandfather loved me, but he never told me so. But it worked out okay because uh, I eventually came to terms with the realization that that was just their way of life. I don't remember that my mother ever told me she loved me. She would hug me a lot. It was a deep love, but not uh, expressed. As a senior at Oklahoma University, I received the impression, I thought it was from God, that I ought to be in vocational Christian service in order to really serve God the best. Uh, that was the wrong impression, but in order to prepare for whatever God had for me, I knew I had to go to the seminary. So I came to the seminary in September of 1940 and uh, enrolled here, and uh, I think it was five weeks later, they held the first drawing for the draft for World War II service. There was a giant fishbowl in Washington, I think it was about five feet in diameter, that held slips of paper with numbers on them from one to a thousand. Well, so help me, my number was thrown out number seven. And uh, so I heard from the draft board almost immediately. So I went down and talked to them and I said, uh, hey, I don't want to be in the walking army. Can I enlist in the Army Air Corps? They said, sure. So I enlisted in the Army Air Corps and was accepted and had my pre-induction physical. And they didn't call me up right away, but uh, that was God's way of turning me around from my impression that I ought to be in vocational Christian service 
and told me that I could serve God as well or a whole lot better as a layman. I enlisted in the Army Air Corps November the 1st, 1941, five weeks before Pearl Harbor. And we heard about it one Sunday afternoon. We got the word when they turned the radio on that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. I was in training in San Diego flying a primary trainer. After graduating from flying school, the uh, second lieutenant pilots would be assigned to different bases. My instructor in the advanced training school recommended that I become an instructor. So all of my World War II flying career, I was in the training command instructing other students how to fly an airplane. We lost a large number of pilots student pilots and instructor pilots to training accidents during the war. They were in such a rush to get the pilots to the front uh, because we needed them badly there. And so the program was accelerated to the point that it really was uh, quite dangerous. And I flew B-25s for over two years uh, instructing in the advanced phase of the flying training program. And I loved that airplane. It, it was a bomber uh, and a very effective one. At the end of the war, I was assigned to training in the B-17. I reported to my training base for B-17 training about three days after they dropped the first atomic bomb. So the, uh, then they dropped the second one and the war was over. I went ahead and finished my training in the B-17, but never got to use it. And I was separated from the Air Corps shortly after that. Most people my age, in my opinion, have vision problems. And many of them do not drive at night. And of course, some of them don't drive at all anymore. But for some reason, uh, Maybe because of my general good health, I still have excellent night vision. My uh, ophthalmologist is really surprised. He said, you're doing great. But I still enjoy, enjoy driving. And I do not have the V8 engine. I have a V6. But the acceleration just really pushes you back in the seat. So it's kind of a fun feeling. I was 10 years old. We were attending a small church in the town of Sulphur, Oklahoma, my mother and my sister and me. And over a period of three or four months uh, attending that church, I became convicted that I was a sinner and I needed a savior. And so one Sunday night, I walked down the aisle and uh, accepted the Lord Jesus as my own personal savior. But I didn't mature very much as a Christian until I went away to college. And I got into the Baptist Student Union movement at Oklahoma University and found some very wonderful friends, uh, many of whom had a very deep spiritual life. And I profited greatly by them in that manner. Uh, also, I learned how to express my concern and relationships with friends. In uh, April of 1951, I was recalled to the Air Force, as they called it then. And I was assigned to Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth flying the B-36, our primary defense weapon against an attack by Russia. We were on call 24 hours a day. If war had been declared, we would have loaded our atom bomb in Fort Worth, Texas, flown to Goose Bay, Labrador, refuel there, and then take off from there to bomb our assigned target in Russia. The B-36 at, at that time was the largest airplane in the world. It was longer than a B-29 and a B-17 nose to tail. That's a lot of airplane. We had a crew of 15 people, and I loved flying that airplane. I had always wanted to fly the big airplanes. We would have had no problem with dropping a bomb, although we knew what destruction it could cause. But I think everybody in my squadron, certainly on my crew, 
had accepted the fact that we signed up to defend our country. And while that possibly meant the destruction and the loss of life of many people, we were prepared mentally and psychologically in every way to accomplish that. 52 years later, in 2004, my wife and I were on a Russian cruise ship. We sailed from St. Petersburg to Moscow through the river and canal systems, and we docked on the northwest side of Moscow after stopping twice in cities en route to uh, minister to the physical and spiritual needs of the Russian people. We had five doctors on board the ship and 10 nurses, and many of the people would be street witnessing, uh, giving away English Bibles, Russian Bibles, children's Bibles, and literature. The day after we docked in Moscow, we had a clinic there in a schoolhouse on a site that was probably less than five miles from where my target was in 1952, if war had broken out. I'm glad we didn't have to drop the bomb to begin with, and I'm equally glad that I was able to be a part of a Christian group going to the very same area where my target was 52 years before, taking them, the Christian witness, and telling them about our Lord Jesus. Uh, it was just a wonderful feeling to, uh, to accomplish that because instead of dropping death and destruction from above, we were carrying in the word of life on the horizontal plane, word of life, eternal life, abundant life, available in our Lord Jesus. I met my wife at Oklahoma University. I had attended uh, my freshman year in another school, and I enrolled at Oklahoma University, so I was a sophomore and met her when she was a freshman. She was dating another boy when I first met her, my first year there, and they were pretty steady. It took a year or two, but uh, it, finally we became engaged. But one night I woke up in a deep, depressive, frame of mind because I had dreamed that she was marrying him and I was attending their wedding. And that had a profound effect on me for a few days, a week or two, because I just couldn't stand the thought of losing her. I always enjoyed knowing that I was delivering people to their destinations safely and comfortably. Well, I flew for Braniff for a little over 30 years, and I loved it. I would have flown for nothing, but, but I was glad they paid me for it. <laughs> Braniff Airlines started up with a route structure that only included two cities, Oklahoma City and Tulsa. It was a single engine airplane, but they soon graduated to the DC-3, and they were flying from Dallas to Chicago and gradually expanding. Uh, started out on the DC-3, and I flew the Convair, 340 and 440, and it was taken over by the DC-6 series. And then we had a DC-7, and then eventually got up to the DC-8, and uh, then to the Boeing 727 for most of my flying. But I enjoyed flying the DC-8 to South America. It was a beautiful airplane. It was a long-range airplane. We flew it nonstop from New York to Buenos Aires. Uh, it was a 10 hour and 20 minute flight, and I think it was the longest nonstop flight in the airline business at the time we were flying it in 1976 and 1977. I really enjoyed that flight, but I enjoyed all of South America. Tell him how old you are, Orville. Yes. At zero. <laughs> you gotta go a little higher. Oh, really? I'm 100 years old. No way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and I still run. Huh? I still run. Wow. I'm very grateful to God yeah. that he's let me live this long. Well, I would encourage you to read the Bible, particularly yeah. the New Testament. It tells about my Lord Jesus, the Someone? Son of God. Because only through Jesus can we get to heaven. Yeah. 
and I would pray that you would make that decision. Yeah. The place where we're going is a support group for some missionaries who translate the Bible uh -huh. into languages all around the world okay. for people that have that they do not have a written language yet. I met the founder of Wycliffe, William Cameron Townsend, in our church in 1965, and I volunteered to help out with Bible translation and particularly the aviation part of it. And I realized that while I had about maybe a dozen Bibles in my house, there were people groups of the world that didn't have, to have one word of God's Word in their own native language. Just felt like I could be of service God's kingdom by helping deliver airplanes to the translators around the world who were there aiding the cause of Bible translation by the safe, efficient transportation where the roads were difficult or impossible. Well, there is a scripture in the Psalms, 139th chapter and 9 and 10 verses, I think, and it goes something like this. If I ride the morning winds to the farthest oceans, there your spirit will guide me, your right hand will uphold me. And that's reassuring to a pilot because the two things you need to be able to fly somewhere is the ability to stay in the air, that is, your engine keeps running, and then you need direction to find the place where you're going. Well, I delivered 46 missionary airplanes in my career. Uh, they were challenging because you don't go down to the filling station and buy a, a road map. You have to be prepared for the over ocean flying, which means the airplane must be equipped with additional radio equipment. It must have additional fuel for the long flights, either Europe or Africa or Southeast Asia, wherever you may be going. It's always exciting to come in and pick up an airplane, take off for New Guinea or South America. So how hard was it to fly, uh, find islands like Majuro without GPS? Oh, my GPS revolutionized. I only had GPS on my last ferry flight. And you fly dead reckoning. Did you ever find yourself uh, hoping to see an island and you couldn't find it? I think I was pretty well prepared for it, but hey, you sweat every trip. Because you look on a globe or a map at the Pacific Ocean, and you see islands scattered all around everywhere. But when you get out there and fly it, you can fly for hours and hours and never see an island. So if the radio station on that island went out, or if you had difficulty with your receiver, uh, you'd be on your own looking for throughout that vast expanse of water to find that little, tiny little dot of an island down there. So it's a grave concern to uh, be able to navigate successfully. William Cameron Townsend was the founder of JARS, also the founder of Wycliffe Bible Translators and SIL International. Our work is not actually in translation, but we come alongside those that are working to do Bible translation to make it possible for them to reach and engage with communities in remote and difficult places. That involves mission aviation and aircraft, as Orville has been greatly involved in, but also other transportation solutions in water and land as well as technology and media solutions and training, again, that make it possible where it's difficult to people to get into do translation for those communities that still need God's word in their language. I took my first ferry flight for George in 1965. About a year or two later, 
they put me on their board, and I was on their board for 39 years. That's remarkable. I can't believe it. And uh, three or four years later, the uh, board chairman retired, and they made me chairman of the board. So I was chairman of the board for 13 of those 39 years, and it was a delight to serve God that way. The longest ferry flight uh, was from Waxhaw, where I'm now standing, to Sentani, Indonesia. We had five legs of flight, the first three of which were all over 15 hours. How are you? Good. Good. I've worked in Papua New Guinea many years. Did you really? What years? First got there in 1980 to 82. Uh -huh. And there's an airplane sitting in the corner here that arrived in Papua New Guinea in 1980. 206? Yes, yeah. Cessna 206 in I 1980. Probably threw it down Is there a there. chance yeah. that you could have been? I think I took five airplanes to PNG, one of them twice. They pranged it in a training accident, shipped it back home, and they rebuilt it here at Jars, and I flew it to, in, to Papua New Guinea the second time. That's this the airplane. Oh, you and really? Look at it. <laughs> then after 50 hours in the country, there's a training accident, yes. a hard landing. Yes. We took it apart, put it in a container, yeah. and shipped it back here to Jars. Who was your chief pilot at the time? Oh, mechanic, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, he, I am told that he said this airplane will never fly again. It did. But it did. And it flew <laughs> yeah. 16,000. 700 hours. Oh, wow. 24,000 landings. And uh, let me tell you about the climax of every missionary fly ferry flight. When you taxi into the ramp, open the door, and hand the keys to the airplane to the missionary pilot already there who's going to be flying that airplane in the work of Bible translation. I read a book by Dr. Kenneth Cooper when I was in Chicago on a layover from our Braniff Airways flight, and I literally read it through in almost one sitting, and it was a highly motivational book. I started running the next day, and I've run a little over 42,500 miles in the last 50 years. Your feet are in remarkably good condition a person who has run for as long as you have. A person looks good for a man of, of any age. Okay, real deep, so he has a two and a half inch expansion, which is very good. Don't let me push it out. Hold it real tight, real tight, real tight. And that's like iron. You have very good quadricep muscle strength. Yeah, or at 100 years of age, you're like a man about 60. So you, you have, you you. have slowed down the aging process, as you yeah. know. There's very few people past 100 years of age who can begin to keep up with you, even be alive, as you know. Yeah, my objective is to slow down as slowly as possible. Slow down as slowly as possible. And you've proven, too, what I've said for years. It's fascinating to know that one can grow healthier as one grows older, and not necessarily the reverse. Who determines that? You do. Here you're 100 years of age, yeah. I'm 87 years of age, still practicing medicine every day. So we're enjoying life of fullest, and our goal for you and for me both is live that long, healthy life of fullest and then die suddenly. We call that squaring off the curve, yeah. and you've already passed that. But you know, as we tell people coming to our clinic, we call them getting Cooperized, find all the recommendations we give to our patients, over 145,000 patients now. If you follow recommendations for diet and weight and exercise, all the various things that we, that we recommend, that you should live 10 years longer than the national average. Wow. That would mean you should live 87 years. I'm already 87 <laughs> trying to prove that, and you're way beyond that. I started running early on with a group called the Cross Country Club of Dallas, and it was competitive but in a friendly way. And I gradually outgrew the group, outaged them, and I looked around and the world records seemed to be attainable. So uh, a little over 10 years ago now, when I was approaching 90, I looked up the world records for the one mile and the 800 meters. And I thought, maybe I can do that. So I engaged a trainer 
and he coached me on starting and breathing and pacing and I went to Boston 10 years ago. I ran the 800 meters in world record time. I think I broke the record by about the 30 seconds, but I really slaughtered the mile. I think the record was 11 minutes to some seconds, and uh, I attacked it vigorously and finished with a time under 10 minutes. I think it was 9.57, something or other. And I'm still the only man in the world that had run a 10-minute mile after the age of 90. I like that. In March this year, I attended the National Indoor Championship Meet near Washington, D.C. It was a track and field meet. I entered five running events, ranging from 60 meters up to 1,500 meters. And uh, I had no competition, so I got gold records just by showing up and suiting up, starting and finishing. But the uh, icing on the cake was that I was able to set five new world records, one for each of the five events that I entered. So I now hold or have set 18 world records. I think two or three of them have been broken. But I have set 18 world records officially. Well, first of all, it's not that amazing anymore people live past 100 years. They're becoming uh, quite, that's quite readily known. But people past 100 years of age who are still competing athletically in running events, that is extremely unusual, one out of a million, I would say. So Orville has, he's had his problems. He was a marathon runner and all when I first met him at age 54, that's 46 years ago, I did his first examination here at the clinic in 1971. I followed him every year after that, too. But what has happened is he's had some medical problems back in 1993. All of a sudden, we discovered he had severe coronary disease without any chest pain whatsoever when he had a six-vessel coronary bypass procedure. That was 1993. Then in 2011, he had a major stroke that occurred in 2011. But he's only incapacitated for 30 days. He's out back running again. One aspect of my running is that it gives me a platform to speak a word for my Lord Jesus. I became a Christian when I was 10 years old. And I've tried to follow my Lord for 90 years now. I've run in races where people alongside me or near me would falter just a little bit as they approached the finish line, uh, two or three or four or five yards. It seemed like they were saying to themselves, there's the finish line, I've made it. And they kind of relax and slow down a little bit. That's not my style. I want to power through running uh, to the very end of the tape, and it served me well. A year ago in Albuquerque, I was running against a 94-year-old man, and he got up, there's just the two of us, in a 60-meter race, and he got off to a fast start. I don't have fast twitch muscles, which enables a, a fast start in running, and so he was three or four yards ahead of me almost immediately. But I kept plugging away and uh, maintaining the pace that I thought would be applicable to that distance. And he must have slowed down because I certainly wasn't speeding up, but I began gaining on him at the halfway mark and at the finish line, I leaned forward just enough to beat him by five hundredths of one second. <laughs> Uh, there's a magazine that came out with a statement that we had met five times after that race, and I, I beat him every time. And uh, I don't want to slow down at the finish line. I don't want to be disqualified by not serving my Lord well all through every day of my life. I want to finish strong for my Lord, don't you? I hope you enjoy life as much as I do. I love life. So Orville's now 100 years old, and he's still actively involved in supporting the work of JARS and the work of Bible translation, and that's a huge encouragement and really an amazing feat. At his age, he's not giving up and not slowing down. He's an active advocate. He's been with us for various events to speak to our friends and, and talk to those of other generations and younger generations about his involvement in supporting the work of Bible translation through JARS and inviting and encouraging others to take part. He is 100 years old, still runs races, and I had the privilege of flying a uh, Cessna 206 in Brazil that was actually given in donation in the name of his son. My son was a marine helicopter pilot, 
and was on a rescue mission in Vietnam in 1970 and was killed when they, they ran into very adverse weather conditions in the extraction process. Uh, about a year later, we helped George buy a Cessna 206, and I later ferried it with my wife along to Brazil, where it has been in service. It may still be in service, I don't know. But uh, we enjoyed flying that airplane because it was named for our son. You know, you're not supposed to lose a child. It's supposed to be the other way around. And it's a very difficult thing, but you must live through it. God wants you to magnify Him in everything you do. And, and dying is a part of living. Well, God can use any experience of life to the benefit, and one of the good things that came out of this was the realization that uh, Curtis lived a wonderful life, and he died in service for our country, and uh, if, if it had to happen, that was the best way it could. My advice to anyone in a similar situation would be that God is still in control. He knows what is happening, and He is in control, in control and he can be relied upon to supply you comfort and uh, help anytime it's needed. I've seen Curtis Rogers <clears throat> and the placard on that plane for yeah. many years flying yeah. over the jungle. Yeah. But um, anyways, we're, we're happy to have you here and this is uh, our 2018 orientation class. So um, whatever you'd like to share, we're all ears. My wife and I served for 13 months in Tanzania. I had a beautiful uh, Cessna 210 flying over Tanzania, which is as big as Texas and part of New Mexico. And we went to an orientation session in Richmond, Virginia. And the first thing they said to us, and probably the most important thing, was be flexible. And never lose sight of the, sight of the fact that you need to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem. How many hours does it take to get from California to Hawaii in a 206? Normally it'd take about 15 to 16 or 17 hours. <clears throat> On one trip, we had a headwind that was projected to be a tailwind. So we logged 19 hours and three minutes from Oakland to Honolulu. How much fuel did you have left? Oh, probably another two hours even. We had lots of fuel. The interesting part about that trip was when we left Honolulu, I had not explained to my wife that radio waves are straight line, just like sunlight. And once you fly about 100 miles or so, depending on your altitude, away from your home departure station, you lose radio contact. Uh, so I was halfway to Johnston Island or so and trying to work anybody that would talk to me, and nobody would talk to me. I wanted to make a position report. And I uh, sensed that maybe she was getting a little bit nervous about the situation because I was using a loudspeaker and she could hear the conversation. So I took off my headset and laid it down and put my bike down. I reached over and gave her a big hug and I said, Honey, when you married me, did you ever think you'd be having this much fun? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't hit me. Just recently, we had Orville with us at an event, a large air show, and he got up to speak and shared his testimony with a bunch of um, younger pilots, people interested in considering mission aviation. And one of the things he said that really touched me is he said, I want to live until I die. Hey, that's good.
free to express my life story in that manner if my viewers understand that I'm doing it as a Christian witness. I want no glory for it. I want no commendation for it. But uh, I found out early in life that it would be wise to save enough money as possible and invest it so that in the future I could be a vehicle for helping God's work, bringing his kingdom to earth from heaven as he asked us to do. And so I got interested in investing. I invested in the stock market, in land and uh, oil and gas, and God blessed in that. Uh, if people ask me, how did I do that? I say, I did not do it, God did it. And it was our privilege and I since my wife's death to give away over $35 million to God's work. My wife and I both maintained a very strong interest and connection with this seminary. And uh, when my wife died 10 years ago, 10 years ago today, she left in her will a substantial amount of money for the erection of this building and all that is in it, and that it can be used in God's service in the training of people with vocational Christian service. This is my favorite deacon right here. Don't tell any of the rest of them, but he's my favorite. Uh, we joined here in 1946. So we had known the pastor at that time when we were in school together in Oklahoma. So we gravitated here normally. He, his name was Dr. W.A. Criswell. He was a great pastor. In a real sense, I've known Orville all of my life because I grew up here at First Baptist Church, Dallas, where he's been a faithful member and deacon for over 60 years. Uh, additionally, my dad worked at the same airline that Orville did at Braniff, and uh, so we have known the Rogers for a long, long time. And uh, I suppose what impresses me most about Orville that really flows out of his relationship with Christ is his deep humility. You know, uh, when you think about all that Orville has accomplished, that would be enough to puff a lot of people up. But Orville realizes uh, any and every good gift in his life comes from God, and he's always very careful to give God all of the credit. There's no contest for what that verse would be, and I use it often when I talk about Orville, and it's Hebrews chapter 12. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, somebody said one time, the test of a person's character is what it takes to stop him. And nothing, no headwind in life has stopped Orville Rogers in running that race for Christ. And so I would just say Orville's faithfulness to Christ isn't because of a lack of difficulties he's faced. It's in spite of those difficulties that his faith has remained strong. I, I knew that Dad flew a lot, but it never felt like he missed important things like piano recitals or football games or anything. And he's getting us back for that now. By going to, <laughs> we're going to his track meets and interviews and banquets and birthdays so every day is a gift and i think he is the one that really epitomizes that i mean he knows it every day every day every year and it just it, it gives us a, a great sense of uh, purpose and uh, looking toward the future and i think that's the way he's made it from 90 to 100 for sure i remember when he first realized he couldn't run a sub 10 minute mile anymore and my friends in their 60s all say, I can't run a sub-10-minute mile, and they're in their 60s. Yeah. They can't remember when they could run a sub-10-minute mile, so it's pretty fun. We try to keep him humble. I mean, I tell him all the time that I could do what he does and be in the newspaper the next day, too. But the only problem is I'd be in the obituary section, <laughs> and he's in the sports section. One of my big memories of my dad and my mom was looking in their bedroom and seeing him on their knees praying. It was regular, and... Not for show, they were prayerful people and made it just a core to their life. And they're always reading the Bible. And they prayed through the missionary prayer list, which 
I don't know if it bothered them. It made me kind of crazy sometimes. But they prayed for every Southern Baptist missionary on their birthday throughout the whole year. It's pretty amazing discipline. One of the things that Dad and Mom really wanted for us was to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus. And uh, one of the, the another thing was he really, they both really supported our education and I know I changed my major three times in college and they were very supportive of helping me find my gifts and my interests and then figuring out how to use that to help others. Dad has been so consistent for so long his whole life uh, and that, that same that same race when we were in Canada he ran every lap indoor and there were about 30 laps, and everyone was within two seconds of each other, just bang, but just like a clock, you know. And that's, that was just kind of like a, a small example of his life, you know, his consistency in so many different ways. He's the same guy that he is today as he was 60 years ago, 70 years ago, 80 years ago. And so that's pretty impressive to be able to be that consistent for that long and love your kids, love your grandkids, then love your great-grandkids. I'm in track right now, and I just think that I, it's great having a grandpa that is 100 and running track, so <laughs> when I run, I just think about him a lot, so I just think that's great. My dad and my mom wanted to be with us on vacations. There's a lot of people <laughs> that talk to them and say, what? You know, that's not a vacation if your kids and grandkids are there. But he started it over 30 years ago, and we go on fabulous trips every summer, and it's a job now coordinating that many people. So it's over 30 people for over 30 years uh, going together someplace crazy, anywhere from the North Pole to Antarctica to Europe or Africa, but they've been an amazing way for this family to bond. I enjoy reading and uh, studying Hebrews 12, one and two because Paul speaks there of running as being a metaphor for living. And uh, I think I can quote it. Uh, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us cast aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and henceforth is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank you.